Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bryce Wakefield, and I'm the exec uh, National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And I'm joined here uh, in our studio by uh, Clive Hamilton. Hello, Clive. Good <laughs> Bryce. And also um, from Berlin uh, by Marika Ulberg. Hello, Marika. Um, well, it's been an interesting uh, couple of weeks. The Prime Minister um, very recently has warned of cyber attacks by a certain state party, usually assumed to be China. The Chinese government um, has warned its citizens of racism in Australia and has warned um, the Chinese students that they perhaps should consider other destinations. Um, the government, the Chinese government, has slapped tariffs on Australian barley. ASIO has raided a um, New South Wales Labor, Labor MP um, over his links to China. And today we've had the, um, the, the announcement that the Australian government would acquire long-range ballistic and anti-ship missiles to counter an adversary in the Indo-Pacific re region. At the AIA National Conference last year, we pondered the question of whether or not there was a new Cold War emerging um, in the region between the United States and its allies and, uh, and China. My, my guests today might say that um, the Cold War never ended, at least from China's perspective. Um, so to talk about that and to talk about the subject of their new book, Head in Hand, exposing how the Chinese Communist Party is reshaping the world. I'll now hand things over to Clive and Monica. Take it away, Clive. Thanks very much, uh, Bryce, and thanks to the AIIA for uh, putting on this uh, event uh, for the book. Um, the, the origin of the book is, uh, is really Silent Invasion, the earlier book uh, that I wrote about CCP influence in Australia. And it was suggested actually by the publisher that um, because there was such a uh, strong interest in Australia for analysis of CCP influence, it would be useful, indeed valuable, to do something similar for you know, the West, by which we mean uh, the uh, North America and Western Europe, in essence, although there's, a, there's some about Australia uh, in the book. Um, and so, uh, I mulled over this idea and realized that I could not write such a book by myself. And uh, so I was in Berlin and uh, met Marika and thought she'd be perfect. And well, I was very, very pleased when she agreed that it would be uh, an important book and worthwhile participating. And therefore, uh, that's how we came to um, collaborate on writing this book. And we wrote it because we both believe uh, that uh, there is a uh, well-organized and systematic attempt by the Chinese Communist Party to reshape the world order um, uh, in the interests of the party. And we also believe that there's widespread ignorance and also naivety about China under the CCP uh, in Western countries. And this is, has led to a dangerous um, way of uh, dealing with China, even amongst those countries that enjoy that experience a kind of skeptical attitude towards the CCP regime, there's a real lack of understanding about what the CCP is, what its kind of DNA is and its modus operandi, and how it goes about uh, uh, influencing in and interfering in other countries, uh, and in this case, uh, Western nations. So what we uh, set out to do in the book was to uncover and then write about the evidence of the comprehensive Chinese Communist Party influence and uh, interference uh, work that has been, it has been conducting over uh, a very long time. Um, and despite the fact uh, that most people who read the newspapers today think of Beijing as engaging in a very uh, uh, upfront, aggressive, out there uh, kind of diplomacy in a uh, form of international relations, in fact, deep uh, beneath uh, that uh, exterior, there has been and remains a, uh, a deeply covert uh, program of um, undermining democracy and rights in other nations. And these covert attempts uh, are not well understood and not uh, well recognised. And it's this uh, ignorance about it, which uh, we want to try to um, dispel 
because we believe that um, shedding light on the operations of the CCP, which prefers to operate in the shadows, is the best way to uh, counteract its, um, uh, its effects on the democratic process and the exercise of rights. So, um, as the title suggests, the book is a detailed expose of this a global program of influence and interference and subversion of uh, Western uh, institutions. And we, we focus particularly on the ways in which the Chinese Communist Party um, carries out its influence operations on the uh, elites in Western countries, that is, elites in uh, politics, uh, in business, uh, in universities, in the cultural sphere, which is uh, particularly interesting and, and rarely uh, recognized. Um, and so that's why uh, in the book, Silent Inv Invasion, and also in the new book, Hidden Hand, there's a great deal of emphasis on the elites and particularly trying to identify certain individuals in order to explain how this process uh, takes place. A very strong theme coming through the, through the book, I'm sure we'll talk about it at some length uh, during today's session, uh, and on which Marika is an expert, uh, being a, um, a sinologist with particular expertise on the CCP's external propaganda system, there's a, the strong theme running through the book is the way in which the Chinese Communist Party has attempted with some very considerable success to uh, reshape the global narrative about uh, China's role in the world, about the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and the, the relationship that, uh, between uh, China and other countries. And part, some of the messages that it's been communicating uh, in many uh, subtle ways has been uh, to promote the idea that autocracies are better than democracies uh, in responding to the modern problems of the world. And of course, COVID-19, which has been in some ways a disaster for the CCP around the world, has been a very fruitful ground for the party to promote the idea that autocracies are better at responding to that kind of crisis. It set out uh, systematically to present China as a reliable partner in the global community at a time when the US has uh, become a global rogue. And in that sense, uh, Donald Trump, while being the president, has pushed back um, against China after a series of presidents who've gone weak need uh, when called up upon to do it. Um, and in that sense, uh, Donald Trump's presidency has nevertheless been, in a way, a godsend uh, to uh, China because he is does behave like a rogue, because he does reinforce perceptions in the West and elsewhere uh, that the US is a, a, a rogue on the international stage. And the party also wants uh, to persuade uh, many around the world that party uh, sources are the most credible uh, in explaining the world, the ones that are believed above all else. We might find this uh, in, some, in some ways fanciful in the West, but there are many places in the world where this isn't uh, regarded as a fanciful proposition. And finally, and I'll finish on this note, uh, the CCP has put enormous effort into the Belt and Road Initiative as a narrative framework for uh, promoting a certain conception of China and an understanding of uh, the nature of the Chinese government. And one of the strongest themes which uh, I think, or most interesting themes which I think came through in the book, and there's something which I learnt in the process of researching and writing it in large measure through my collaboration with Marika, is the way in which the Belt and Road Initiative is at one level uh, all about, as the propaganda goes, uh, trade and investment and connectivity and building infrastructure and creating a more integrated world to the benefit of all. Um, underneath that is a far more interesting, far more subtle and far more, I, I would, I, we would argue, perilous a program on the part of the Chinese Communist Party, and that is to use the Belt and Road Initiative as a way of reshaping the global narrative. Um, and we see that, and uh, we explain this in the book uh, in some detail, how the Belt and Road Initiative is used as a kind of um, ideological Trojan horse, if I could use that overworked metaphor, to, uh, to win influence among elites and to seed a new way of thinking about China and the global community, one that is developed by Chinese Communist Party propagandists and party theorists in Beijing.
So I might stop at that point and allow uh, Marika to take up the story. Okay, uh, video's back on. Um, yeah, thank you so much um, to the AIA um, for hosting us here for this. Um, I want to, basically, I want to supplement Clive's introduction about um, the basic idea of the book and what we cover by zooming in on basically the motivations and strategies used by the primary actor that we cover. And as you've already seen or heard, um, we talk not about China, we don't talk about Chinese interference, Chinese influence, et cetera, et cetera. We specifically focus on the Chinese Communist Party. Um, we think it's incredibly important to distinguish between China, the Chinese, and the one hand, um, and the Chinese Communist Party on the other hand, for several reasons. Um, one, because the Chinese Communist Party likes to portray itself as like the only conveyor of truth about all things Chinese. Um, and that is obviously not true. China is a lot more diverse than this. It's also important to make sure that under suspicion doesn't fall on actually Chinese people, people of Chinese heritage. Um, but there's also, you can also make a case very clearly that you need to look at this <clears throat> from the perspective, uh, at, at, at this topic from the perspective of the Chinese Communist Party, because understanding the motivation behind what is happening and also understanding the basic approach um, of that, that the party takes in its global influence operations is essentially a transfer of a lot of strategies and principles that the party also uses in China itself. So that's basically the globally transferred. Um, yet somehow we, we have tended um, to write the CCP out of the picture a little bit. We talk about President Xi Jinping, even though the fact that Xi Jinping is president of China is basically meaningless. What's important is his leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, we talk about things such as the PLA, we think of the People's Liberation Army as the Chinese army, but it's actually not a state army, it's a party army, just um, like media aren't state-owned, they're party-owned, so the party really is the central actor, as most of you who are here are probably aware. Um, but this is also true for the basic motivation behind influencing. And the basic idea here is what, what is the Chinese Communist Party trying to achieve? And the basic goal here really is to make the world safer for itself, to create long-term legitimacy for itself, and to make sure that this long-term legitimacy will help it stay in power in the long run. Traditionally, they've relied on economic performance and nationalism for the legitimacy. Economic performance has kind of, you know, been a little less and less um, stable over the last few years. And now with COVID-19, it's even riskier. Nationalism is a double-edged sword. So what they want is basic recognition, as Clive already said, that their system <clears throat> is ideal for the 21st century, is at least as good as democracies, if not, and increasingly in that direction, if not better. Um, because the party finds itself since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, the party has found itself in this position where it is, finds itself in a world it considers hostile, um, where it's one of the few communist parties left in the world. And initially it tried to manage this hostile world. It views itself as this as a hostile world, like Cold War thinking never really stopped in China. Um, the Cold War never ended for the CCP. So initially um, the party tried to deal with that through patriotic education of its citizenry and setting up censorship mechanisms. But the, the whole idea here is in the long run, the CCP thinks we cannot rely on things such as the Great Firewall. We have to make sure that the world itself changes and becomes more beneficial to our interests. That includes stuff such as what the party refers to as the global public opinion environment, that basically it's not enough if the party keeps saying we're the best and our narrative is the right thing to Chinese people. People all around the world have to repeat it in order for the party to feel secure in the long run. This is um, what the, the party refers to as its global discourse power, which it needs to strengthen. Um, and the other factor, of course, here is the global alliance system, which the party wants to reshape 
in its own favor because right now China doesn't have a lot of allies and it is surrounded by systems of U.S. alliances around itself. So the whole idea is increase its own discourse power and we can existing alliance systems, the existing structures um, to make sure that China and the CCP is strengthened. Um, in terms of the strategies that the party employs here, um, we also, what we see is a classic approach that we also see domestically, um, which can kind of has been referred to as the United Front United Front thinking, United Front principle, you've probably heard about United Front work and the United Front work department. What I'm talking about here is the underlying concept of United Front thinking, where you divide basically all people in China, all groups in the world, all countries in the world into three areas, like the friendly ones, the neutral camp and the enemy camp. And the idea is to make sure <clears throat> that you ally as many neutral and friendly entities against the principal enemy. The principal enemy will vary according to the situation that you look at. If you're looking at a, at a single nation state, for instance, China looking at Australia and says our goal is we want to get Australia to sign on to the Belt and Road. Um, and the federal government says, no, we don't want to. So in that case, the federal government is the main obstacle and you have to work with all potential allies, which in this case would include provinces and states, to basically surround that state and make sure to work against that. Um, on a global level, the principal enemy is the United States, which is considered the global hegemon. So what you have to do in order for China to succeed in this field, for the CCP to succeed, is win over as many US allies as possible, or rather make sure that countries that were previously allied with the United States first move into a position where they are neutral if there's a conflict between the United States and China. So they take no position to move them from the enemy camp to the neutral zone and eventually to move them from the neutral zone into the friend zone where they don't they don't just stay neutral um, on, on any conflict, but they actually actively side with China. Um, so this is one principle um, that's very important to divide countries into these camps and to just align as many po as possible um, in sometimes often temporary alliances to just shift the overall balance of power. Um, another really important thing is you don't try to pick fights with too many at the same time. What you usually try is you pick one country and you try to isolate it and make an example of it. Um, in Europe, this has happened to Sweden, which picked a fight with the Chinese government because the Chinese government kidnapped a Swedish citizen um, who's now supposedly, according to the Chinese government, renounced the Swedish citizenship and is sitting in jail for 10 years. But under the circumstances, the Chinese government really ran a sustained campaign against Sweden. Um, not so much to win over the Swedes, but maybe to make an example of them. And a quite similar thing recently happened to Australia when Australia demanded that there be an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. Um, of course, later that demand was picked up by more and more countries so that in the end, China said we'll have that inquiry. But Australia as the initiator of that inquiry, of that proposal, was then subsequently punished by the CCP um, with restricted restrictions on exports, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, unfortunately, the standard reaction on the international stage is lack of solidarity instead of standing up for one another. Most countries are simply glad that it hits someone else and not us. Um, I'm going to stop here so that we can start um, our question and answer part, but this was just meant as a very brief introduction to the motivations behind what we're describing and the principles of, of, of what is going on. And I am very happy to go into more concrete details and examples in, in our discussion. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Great, thank you very much, um, uh, Marika and Clive. Um, uh, a, a great introduction, uh, set, set the same for what are the growing number of questions, but I'm going to ask my question first, as usual. Um, you mentioned, Marika, that um, you, you, you mentioned um, patriotic education, which got me thinking um, about a few things. And to what degree, um, it, it sounds to me like the, the premise of your book is that, um, is that this strategy is um, 
tightly controlled by elites in Beijing and particular figures, and it's a very conscious um, divide and conquer strategy, if you like. Um, and it's wedded to particular notions of the Chinese state that are informed by perhaps things like the patriotic education policy. But when I think back to the early 2000s, there was some discussion among Asia scholars that the um, that the that the patriotic education viewpoint had gotten out of hand to some extent, and that there were elites in Beijing who um, who did not like the sort of caustic narratives that were coming out of protest movements in China, um, for example, um, but felt that they had to respond. Um, to what degree do you think that, that the, the, the forces that you're, you're talking about are really in control of the elites that you, that you consider? Um, that's an interesting question, and it kind of ties to something that I also said um, when in, in the introduction. Basically, I, I agree that in the long run, the CCP wants to get away from nationalism as the principal form as a legitimator for itself, precisely for the reason that you mentioned is it's this double-edged sword because it can be deployed. And I do think the party has more control, like the party will say, oh, we have no control over it. I think the party is quite adept at signaling to people when to stop. Um, and it's signaling to people when to start. And when they do signal that it's time to stop, oftentimes people do stop. Um, that all said, yes, I agree absolutely that they want to get away from nationalism as this legitimating factor for themselves because precisely it can be turned against the party. Um, it can result in calls from intellectuals or people on the on the on the fringes to call for actually tougher action um, and to say the government the Chinese government isn't being tough enough um, and they need to do more to stand up for China's interests. So I do think they want to get away from that. This is precisely why they're looking towards more narrative and discursive control um, and what's referred to in Beijing as ideological security as um, a force of legitimacy that, again, this isn't just about, yay, China, China is the best and we're going to stand up for China's interests, which is still relevant and this is still happening a lot. But on top of that, they want to have a more permanent form of legitimacy um, that doesn't as that cannot as easily be used against the party. Um, and this is kind of where this discursive power on a global scale actually comes in because the idea is, you know, we're competent and we are internationally recognized as the best system for China. Look, your population, all the foreign politicians are saying the same thing. Um, this is where the party wants to get. So that precisely it doesn't really have to rely on shoring up nationalism anymore when it wants to, you know, cover up any problem. Um, so there, I do think there's awareness of that. Okay, very good. Uh, Clive. Yeah, I, I just add that um, uh, to reinforce Maraka's view that uh, nationalism, you know, they're kind of riding the tiger and we've seen some uh, kind of uh, uncontrolled outbursts of patriotic sentiment uh, that the party has decided uh, not in its interests. I mean, there were some anti-Japanese riots, for example, that got out of hand and the party had to crack down uh, very hard against them in Beijing. Um, and elsewhere within China. Um, but there is a kind of historical irony in all of this because when the CCP decided after Tiananmen Square that they would put in a huge amount of emphasis on patriotic education, so to the point where uh, many of the Chinese students who arrive in Australia um, are intensely uh, patriotic, and in fact, studies have shown they become more patriotic while they're studying overseas, not all, but some. Um, and there, of course, history has been completely reshaped so that, you know, they come to Australia and discover all kinds of things if they're open to it about China's history, like, for example, uh, what happened in 1989. But there's a great irony that uh, having been very much a, 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 an internationalist party uh, uh, focused on um, solidarity of uh, the workers of the world, very much in the kind of common turn uh, tradition, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, China under the CCP 
uh, began to develop a very, very strong uh, basis of uh, nationalism for the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. The party said, you know, we represent China. They even rehabilitated Confucius, for God's sake, who was dismissed as, you know, an evil uh, bourgeois influence uh, during the Cultural Revolution. So as might, we might kind of see it come full circle in that if the CCP succeeds in its uh, determination to uh, uh, have uh, discourse control over the narrative in, in the rest of the world. Now, very serious about this. Um, you know, as the uh, Global Times let slip uh, at one point in an article that, you know, it sees the Great Firewall as a temporary uh, protective device against the infiltration of uh, uh, dangerous Western ideas. And it's temporary because uh, the CCP anticipates a time when those Western ideas in the West will be defeated and uh, CCP ideals uh, will be the dominant ones and therefore you won't need a barrier uh, between China and the rest of the world. And so having achieved its objective, if it does, there would be a new kind of internationalism where, you know, the workers of the world uh, and the bourgeois of the world would unite once again under that kind of umbrella of CCP discourse power. Okay, great. Um, so we have, uh, I mean, I, I have more questions of my own, but I don't think I'm going to need them. Um, we did have a question I saw from Patrick Moore, um, who talked about uh, whether or not, um, where is it? So why is China today seemingly antagonizing um, as many, I guess, as it can, such as the United States, Australia, UK, Hong Kong, India, South China Sea, etc. So, um, I, I guess if I'm if I want to flesh out this question a little bit, my um, understanding of your argument would be that um, that you're saying that um, having read a little bit of the book, um, that um, China has been covertly um, attempting to establish influence around the world. Um, and I guess the corollary of that is that um, when it overtly attempts to do so with its wolf warrior diplomacy, for example, there is the potential to backfire. Do you think we're going to see more of this or does China more of this um, assertive diplomacy or, or do you think that um, China would prefer to do things in a more subtle way, I guess? Well, I think it's doing both. Uh, it's doing the, the, the assertive approach as well as the subtle approach. and. You know, we talk about this quite a lot in the context of Europe, um, of uh, the, the kind of uh, dual approach to uh, asserting, uh, gaining influence. Um, it, it's a bit of a puzzle as to why in the midst of the coronavirus, well, it's a puzzle to me at least, Marika might be less puzzled, um, why Beijing has decided to become so aggressive uh, in its diplomacy where it's not getting its way. Uh, Marek has given some of the explanation, and that is a particular uh, CCP viewpoint uh, uh, where it distinguishes between um, friends and enemies and those in between, and uh, isolating those who regards as enemies, who are always a small handful of, you know, if you read uh, CCP uh, or, or CCP linked uh, newspapers in China and abroad, um, they, for, they even characterize Australia, you know, the broad the broad populace of Australia are actually sympathetic to China, and it's only a, a small handful of troublemakers who are creating the, the, the problem, and, and the troublemakers uh, have come to include very recently in Australia, ASPE. ASPE, uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute for those overseas, has become a kind of a whipping boy uh, for the Chinese Communist Party. And they are an example of the small um, group of troublemakers, and so the party believes that it can at the one time uh, uh, defeat this small group of troublemakers, wherever they may be in Australia, in Hong Kong, in the United States, um, uh, or in Sweden. Uh, but the mass of the people will see the value of the Chinese uh, Communist Party or China's way of doing it and, and the benefits of engaging with China economically and uh, becoming friends of, uh, of China. And so I think that it has decided, I'm um, speculating here, that, that Beijing has decided that China is now sufficiently powerful that it doesn't have to uh, pretend to be anything other than it is. And Xi Jinping's position within the party is now very strong, after it was a bit wobbly during the early weeks of the coronavirus crisis, uh, that that's, they're kind of going for broke. 
and uh, it's you know, and so it's very hard to predict how that might unfold. I'm, I'm sure Mariah will have more to say. Um, I think um, I think that is one possible explanation that it's like it is how it is, and the world can see us now. I my my interpretation, and this is my educated guess, because obviously I can't look into the heads of anybody sitting in Beijing, but my sense is that even though the CCP is trying to make it seem like it has weathered the coronavirus crisis, it has taken quite a big hit. Um, it did not announce any GDP numbers for this year. It is struggling with quite massive unemployment. Um, so I do think, even though I don't think that Xi, Xi Jinping is in a position where he's like insecure and is gonna get toppled or anything, but the party itself, is in a way operating in what you could term crisis mode. Um, and in crisis mode, what the party seems to do more than usual, I mean, the motivation, the first line, the most important audience is always domestic and the international audience is always secondary. But in, term, in times of crises, I think the focus inward actually becomes more intense, the focus on the domestic audience um, and on shoring up domestic sentiment becomes more important than international recognition. So under these circumstances and operating in crisis mode where the party needs to weather a fairly big economic crisis, the internal audience is more important and it's okay to pick more battles with people abroad than usual. So the party is basically deviating from its principle of we make sure we only pick battles with a couple of countries at a time, at a time, and make sure we establish harmonious constructive relationships with everybody else. The party's going against that. Um, and I do think at least some people in the party are aware that that's backfiring. But I think that is a product to some extent of this crisis mode of China turning inwards. Um, and rethinking basically a strategy of how are we going to cope with us because obviously this crisis um the COVID-19 crisis is not over um we're probably going to be dealing with the disease itself for at least a, a year or, or longer um we're going to be dealing I think with the economic fallout for much longer than that so this is basically the party focusing inward um, and making what could be considered mistakes from our perspective internationally by being too offensive and by offending too many people at the same time. But it makes sense from the internal crisis mode logic. And basically, I think they may tone down some of it um, because, again, some people are quite aware that this is offending countries, so they may go back to the smarter approach of just picking fights with a few countries at the same time. But as long as this crisis is with us, I think there's always going to be potential um, for things escalating in this direction. Great. Thanks so much, um, Clive and Monica. Uh, we have a question here from our friends at the Swiss Embassy. Pietzi? Um, how they ask about um, multilateral diplomacy um, and what what do what are the implications of your argument for international law and the global rules based order? I note in your book um, that you've got an entire chapter called "Reshaping Global Global Governance." If you'd like to uh, talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Um, okay. Absolutely. But I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll. I'll. I'll go ahead on this one. So basically, China, the Chinese government, likes to say of itself that they support multilateralism and they like to get other countries to repeat that China is a force for multilateralism and that you know it supports this. Unlike the United States, which is pulling out of everywhere. Um, the thing is, no, China isn't really a good thing for multilateralism at all, um, because one. It doesn't particularly love multilateral institutions. Um, it prefers to have one-on-one -on -one bilateral relationship, which you can see in frameworks such as 17 plus one in Europe, which I think have been accurately described as 17 um, relationships of one-on-one. -on -one. Because I mean, China has a big advantage there because in one-on-one -on -one relationships, it's always gonna be the bigger country. Um, there's always also a strong tendency for from the Chinese government to push for non-binding things in all international organizations that already exist. Um, so the, 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 the general trend here is 
yes, the Chinese Communist Party wants to get involved in these organizations, but it wants to make sure that these organizations have no power to enforce any binding targets on a sovereign state, such as primarily such as itself. It never, it doesn't want to bind itself to those rules. So even when we talk about climate co cooperation, which I do think is necessary to do with China, the, the CCP will always make sure or will always push towards non-binding targets, um, nation states basically policing themselves on those targets. And I mean, as we know from, I guess, companies self-policing, self-policing on targets isn't usually very effective. So I think in that regard, we actually have a problem with a stronger China Chinese presence in those international organizations. It actually weakens some of the progress that we have made in that order in working towards binding targets in some of the international regimes that we've set up. And that that's a problem. Okay, very good. Um, all right, we have a question here from um, Susan Green. You talked uh, at some length, I think, of um, a sort of divide and conquer strategy where where China would, would focus on different levels of government. Um, Susan Green asks, how would you characterize Victoria signing up to the Belt and Road Initiative? Naive, harmless, uh, since the state is not responsible for foreign policy or something else? And I think I'll give this one to Clive first because uh, it is an Australian question. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a very fascinating uh, example uh, to watch how it's uh, unfolded. Uh, in Victoria it has certain parallels with um, the way in which the CCP went around uh, went about uh, grooming uh, certain members of the elites in Italy uh, which as you know is the only Western nation that has uh, signed a, a Belt and Road Agreement and so I've been watching it um, for quite some time that is events in Victoria and the way in which uh, the Labour Party in particular, although there are similar forces operating within the Liberal Party, um, a united front uh, organisations and uh, influential individuals within the Chinese Australian community have been establishing networks with certain Labour figures, in particular the um, Premier, Premier Andrews himself, and effectively you know, what, uh, what I've begun to call a grooming. I actually wrote a, a kind of definition of grooming, which I like to use in this context. And that means the use of psychological techniques to befriend and establish a rapport uh, with a target in order to lower their inhibitions, create a sense of reciprocity and opening them up to see the world in a way that suits uh, one's interests. And so what's been fascinating about the Victorian example is a couple of things. One is um, the way in which um, the, those members of the Victorian political and business elites that have been strongly pushing for Victoria to sign up to the Belt and Road Agreement have, um, have fallen, fallen for the CCP narrative about the Belt and Road Agreement, what it means and what the benefits are. And when you look at the Belt and Road Agreement itself, the Victorian one, um, and wherever they do become public, this is particularly interesting to do. There's a kind of headline clauses which talk about trade agreements and investment facilitation and uh, interconnectivity and that kind of thing. But if you look further down the agreements, and this is the case with the Victorian ones, there are all these uh, kind of soft and cuddly clauses. That, you, you know, you tend to... Uh, you know, skip over is thinking it's not very important. I would argue actually they're more important than the than the trade and investment provisions. And they're all about they're all about um, clauses which establish mechanisms for greater people to people exchange and um, uh, uh, cultural exchanges and media agreements. And these are the ways in which the CCP plans to assert its uh, discourse power. And What's been interesting with the Victorian one is that we, we've noticed, as we've noticed in other countries that have signed up to them, is that those uh, elite members who are at the forefront of pushing forward uh, the agreements um, and speaking in, in, on behalf of them, they begin to adopt the CCP language. They begin to speak in the kind of terminology developed by the, the, the party um, that 
that the party uses to surround and promote um, the Belt and Road Agreements. And so it's as if, um, you know, uh, language like, uh, well, actually in the, uh, in the Victorian Belt and Road Agreement, um, it commits the state, uh, I've got this bit of it here, the aspiration, aspiration of promoting the Silk Road spirit, centering on peace, cooperation, openness, inclusiveness, mutual learning and mutual benefits and aspiration to further enrich such spirit in keeping with the new era. I mean, this is just infused with CCP ideology, this kind of statement, and yet it's kind of deniable. Uh, but I notice that Daniel Andrews, he, he speaks CCP speak when he talks about uh, the way in which he wants to make Victoria China's gateway to Australia and the win-win situations of, and the friendships and peace and harmony and cooperation that the Belt and Road Agreement will establish. So I think it's been quite a brilliant uh, achievement on behalf of the party to, uh, to uh, uh, have Victoria sign up to the BRI as an illustration, and Marika alluded to this earlier, of the CCP tactic of using the countryside to surround the city. Very good. Okay. Um, we have another question here from um, uh, Marika. Did you want to chime in on, on that question at all? Or? No? Okay, good. So we have another question here from Robert Webster. Um, and it's about the, um, well, well, let me just read it. The picture you paint of the CCP under Xi is immutable and all powerful. Is there no prospect of dissent, disunity or change, especially if the economic mir miracle cannot be continued? So is there, is, is there a possibility that things could go another way? And um, especially if, if, um, if the economic benefits that the party has been promising dissolve? Just briefly, I'm sure Marika will be able to expatiate on this better than I can. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the position of the party is, is fragile and the party knows that. I mean, all kinds of things could come along and, and profoundly undermine it. A um, financial crisis is probably uh, the one that uh, most threatens its viability. Um, uh, a, a very big outbreak of coronavirus could lead to all kinds of trouble. I mean, Wuhan became you know, for a few weeks there, kind of ungovernable. And uh, the people of Wuhan were extremely angry and took a lot of effort to uh, uh, bring them under control. In the longer term, uh, Xi and uh, party people know that uh, China's uh, aging population represents a severe threat to the sustained uh, growth. And there's a, uh, some belief that the Xi and the party recognize that China has a, a window of opportunity no more than perhaps 20 years in order to establish its global domination because it'll be much more uh, difficult uh, thereafter. And within, but within the party itself, um, Xi, of course, set about from late 2012 when he became general secretary of the party, uh, he, he went about ruthlessly purging the party of um, alternative opinion, uh, which uh, cemented his power but also creates all kinds of problems of groupthink and fear within, uh, particularly in the provincial elements of the party, as we saw again, illustrated with the uh, outbreak of the pandemic in Wuhan. It can lead to all kinds of problems for the party breaking out across China. Um, yeah, here's the thing. I think this, sorry if I, if I may add to that. Um, I, I think, yeah. Absolutely. And again, what we're what we're presenting here and the strategy of the party is not just born out of confidence. It is also born out of the lessons that the party has taken in from the Soviet Union. We've studied that quite systematically. What did the Soviet Union go do wrong? Um, if you are an unelected official, uh, you are a lot more nervous about power transitions than you are as an elected official because generally it doesn't look pretty if there is no transfer power mechanisms which Xi Jinping has basically with his presidency for life has destroyed what little power transition mechanisms that actually were within the communist party at least internally so right now yes a, a large horror scenario within the party that motivates a lot of what it does is either the Soviet scenario or even a Romanian scenario scenario where people don't just get kicked out, but they get killed. Um, and I think they take that quite seriously. Um, I do think, I do think, especially under Xi Jinping, we have completely moved away from a prospect for this ending peacefully, um, because the party has 
and it's not it's not like if there's discontent there are very easy ways for people to be able to top of the party because precisely because the party made very sure that it's incredibly difficult for dissent within the population to translate and to organize dissent where the society where society can actually link up and push back um, a lot of energy that the party has expended has gone into two areas. One is the domestic public security state um, and surveillance. And the other is, of course, the loyalty of the military um, that is sworn to the party and to the general secretary, Xi Jinping, personally. So I do think there's plenty of room for conflict, um, but also a lot of ways in which the party has made sure that that's, this cannot easily translate into it being ousted from power. So when that conflict arises, it might get very ugly for the people who are trying to bring that change about, um, mainly because Xi Jinping has led the party into the, into the situation where it's very difficult to bring any change from within. Okay, very good. Uh, well, very good. Um, the, um, the question then that raises and that's been being raised in my mind is that what do we do about it? Um, uh, there's a question here from Karen, Karen, Karen Zhang, for example. She says, how should Australia, and I guess other countries, other middle powers, perhaps in Europe as well, approach a power like China? Do you think it works for or against Australia's interests to be loud in our approach towards China on the international stage? Um, the, the typical response has been to approach China with a certain degree of delicacy. Is, is that something that we ought to reconsider? I think, I think honestly, oh, sorry. Um, just jumping ahead here, if I may. Um, I think, one, I think loud diplomacy works better than silent diplomacy. I mean, silent diplomacy is better than not talking about anything, but I think there is this fear among our politicians that if they engage in loud diplomacy, then they won't be able to actually work with the Chinese government in the areas where they feel they absolutely have to work with China, such as climate change, global health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think we need to get away from that. Um, and that basically what governments have to do is get a better understanding of the party interests and where there are mutual interests of any. Because the thing is, if the CCP is really interested in a form of cooperation, that cooperation will happen regardless of how loud the government is on the international stage. It may get delayed for, for reasons like send a signal, but if the party wants it, that cooperation is going to happen. If the party doesn't want that cooperation or if the Australian or the European or the whatever side is way more interested in something than the CCP is, that cooperation proposal is on very shaky legs to begin with. And you can stand on your head and dance and praise the CCP, you're not gonna get a meaningful result. Case in point, the European governments have been trying to get an investment agreement from China, where basically they're getting concessions from the CCP. It's been ongoing for seven years, and it's not going to happen because, again, this is much more in the interest of the Europeans than in the Chinese. But European, government, European governments then hold themselves back in the hopes of getting some concessions from, from the Chinese government, which they're not going to get. So I think, honestly, my biggest advice to any country is just be more realistic about what you can do in cooperation with the Chinese government, what are their interests. If you have actual mutual agreement and not just the CCP says, oh yeah, we love multilateralism too. If you have actual agreement based on their own core interests, proceed, but also criticize because it's not gonna endanger that. If you don't have that, honestly, you're not gonna get anything meaningful. You may get an agreement that's gonna have a lovely red seal on it, but it's not going to be, it's going to be broken at the first instance. Um, and that's really my main advice. Get this realistic assessment of the party you're dealing with. Okay, Clive. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I think uh, Australia and, West, and European countries and, and Canada in particular have been blighted for years by this uh, belief that um, the Chinese Communist Party, the whole regime is, has this extraordinary mystique about it. You need experts who really understand it, who can explain the position. And it's a very kind of delicate, fragile relationship. And 
you know, we, because we don't understand it, uh, we must tread very carefully and do all we can to keep Beijing happy. And of course, this is exactly, you know, Beijing has nations, you know, by the proverbials uh, when they're behaving in that way. And so how should we react? I mean, well, it depends on what kind of country you are, where you are. I mean, the United States can behave in a way that quite unlike uh, Australia can. I don't think Australia should be loud, but nor should we be a, um, fearful and delicate. I mean, you know, the DFAT approach of, you know, um, you know, of, of treading on tiptoes and not saying anything to offend Beijing, I think has been very damaging uh, to Australia's interests for many, very many years. So the alternative between delicate and loud is firm and calm, uh, really making it clear what our position is, uh, making it clear what our values are, making it clear what we're not going to trade off for economic interest, but doing it calmly, but firmly and consistently. Because once you give some ground, the CCP will believe that they have you again and they'll keep pushing and pushing. And that's why, although you know, obviously for those who know me, I'm not a person that has much ideological concordance with the Morrison government. I think the approach that it's taking in this very difficult time is really um, exactly right. And so nations like Australia in responding to uh, uh, Beijing in the way it's been behaving in recent years, we have to set up defences against it. We have to set up ways of protecting democratic institutions in our political process from CCP interference. Um, and so it's extremely gratifying, I have to say, to see the AFP moving for the first time against uh, an alleged uh, foreign interference operation in Sydney when it raided the home and uh, office of the of the uh, New South Wales Labor MP, and in particular, I think more importantly, the staff member who um, is suspected um, of uh, being engaged in some kind of foreign interference activity. And so the, the uh, putting into practice of Australia's uh, potentially very powerful foreign interference legislation, I think, is something that many people have been um, waiting for, and certainly many uh, nations uh, or governments in Ottawa and Washington and London and uh, Tokyo have been watching uh, very closely indeed. And of course, the last thing which almost goes without saying, but it's of such fundamental importance, and that is for a nation like Australia and others uh, to deal with Beijing, we must do it collectively. I mean, no single country can stand up to Beijing uh, indefinitely. It's essential that democratic nations um, form alliances of one form or another um, or cooperative agreements of ways of pushing back to reduce uh, CCP influence abroad, including in those uh, international institutions. And we've seen that the way in which uh, Western nations allowed the Beijing to gain very substantial influence within the WHO, we've seen that uh, in recent months, the reputation of the WHO has been shattered. I mean, it, it, it was such an appalling approach by the WHO to allow itself, or the member states, to allow the WHO to become, uh, if not captive, then certainly heavily influenced by Beijing in a way where in uh, jet throughout January of, of this uh, year, the WHO was giving credibility to, by reproducing, Beijing's narrative about COVID and in particular, the claim that this was not a virus that, that was subject to community transmission. Now, when the WHO wanting to be nice uh, to Beijing and to have meetings with uh, Xi Jinping, um, parroted misleading health information, the global consequences of that have been catastrophic. And it's no wonder that WHO has attracted such um, animosity from many quarters and will have to completely remake itself after. So that's what happens when you allow these international institutions to be uh, influenced uh, in this way without uh, Western nations, those committed to uh, proper inter international institutions that will serve the global community, allowing the CCP to gain influence in them. Okay, then, I mean, that raises the question, I guess, of um, China's own or Chinese-led institutions as well. Zara Kempton, Hello again, Zara, um, asks, despite American objections, Australia joined the China-led Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, an investment bank. Do, do you think that this is serving our interests? Where is the money being spent and how does this increase Chinese power via the BRI? 
Well, very briefly, I'd, I'd just make the point that if a decision were uh, to be made now about whether Australia should join the AIIB, I think the, I think the answer would almost certainly be no, because there's a much uh, deeper understanding across government and the institutions and the bureaucracy of how there's uh, another agenda uh, going on and that uh, Australia joining it has been part of Beijing's program of dividing the Western Alliance uh, against itself. So um, whether it's now time to start considering withdrawal is not something that um, I'd will be willing to comment on without you know, much closer scrutiny. Okay. But I don't do you. No. Okay, there, there, there was a question here. I'm sorry, I can't find it now because there are so many. Uh, but it was um, basically a question um, concerning your own personal experience and whether or not you have, um, you have had, there have been any consequences of your research um, in ways, uh, have you, ha have you had, um, have you had, have you come under pressure because of the, the type of research that you, you're putting out? Maraka? Um, I mean, yes and no. It's not as extreme as some of the things that some colleagues have experienced. Um, there have, has been much more coordinated harassment against some people that I know, including um, email spoofing, spam emails sent out, people getting hacked, people getting targeted by various campaigns. I mean, what I get, I get the occasional hate on social media, which I think if you get involved in any public debate, that's inevitable. Um, but I mean, for me, for me, the personal cost really is that I, I don't think I can go back to China. Um, I don't think that as of yesterday, I can go back to Hong Kong. I've lived in China for a very long time. I've lived in Hong Kong for, for some time. Um, in a way, both places I considered at least a partial home for a while. And I certainly can't go back that I'm quite certain of. Um, I don't think I would get a visa. Um, and if I would get a visa, I would be a little suspicious um, why they're letting me in when they haven't let me in in the past anymore. Um, so it, it has a personal cost. This also obviously affects the things that I can research, um, even though, I mean, access in China, even with people who go in for research, it's getting more and more difficult anyway. But yeah, I mean, there's been this personal cost. And I do think, I mean, if the book becomes more popular and is read more widely, I do think there'll be some much uglier form of backlash um, than what we have faced so far. Um, well, I think if um, silent invasion experience is anything to go by, you know, you might want to strengthen your locks over there, Marika, <laughs> because um, what well, we've seen, I mean, Traditionally, you know, there's been a sense, if I can put this in a crude way, that, um, you know, people like us, if I can mention Marika in the same context, we've been certain, you know, protected in, in, in a certain way by the fact that, you know, we're white. Uh, you know, it's really people of Chinese extraction, not to mention, yeah, well, of Chinese extraction, including uh, uh, Uyghurs and Tibetans, you know, aren't ethnically Chinese, of course. Um, I mean, they have suffered... Uh, kind of horrendous um, harassment uh, and worse uh, overseas. But I think the kind of wall of whiteness, if I can put it that way, is being breached um, around the world. And there are some really quite disturbing cases. Um, Anne-Marie Brady in New Zealand, of course, with the burglaries on her home and office. Uh, John Garno in Melbourne has uh, revealed that he and his family have suffered serious harassment in the street, as it were. Uh, by uh, what are almost certainly MSS agencies. We, we read a, a deeply disturbing story about the campaign of um, attacks on the family of, uh, of Mac Horton uh, in Melbourne. Um, for my own part, um, you know, I don't like to say too much about it, but after Silent Invasion came out, I mean, it was a bit of a shock to me to find uh, uh, people uh, turning up unbidden uh, to my office and offering me counter-surveillance advice. I mean, I thought, whoa, I mean, I just wrote a book about 
China, why do I need counter surveillance advice? But yeah, certain things happened and the office building I, I, I worked in, which is on the theology campus of uh, Charles Sturt University in Canberra, went from being a building that was open to anyone to walk through to being in complete lockdown with security cameras and the whole box and dice. And that wasn't done out of paranoia, that was done as a result of specific incidents uh, taking place and advice from people whose, whose job it is to uh, look after the security of people who, um, who, who are threatened by state actors. So um, yeah, it's a serious issue and it's certainly something that I take very seriously. Okay, well, we've come to the uh, end of the program, as it were. The book is Head in Hand, uh, Exposing How the Chinese Communist Party is Reshaping the World by Clive Hamilton and Manika Oldberg. I'd like to thank my guests today, Clive. Thank you very much, and Manika. It's great to have you here from Berlin. Um, and I'd like to remind you all that uh, the AIIA is a membership organization. We have branches around the country. Um, if you are interested in what we do here, you might um, like to sign up uh, as a member. Um, go, on, go on our website and check it out on our website, which is internationalaffairs.org.au. You can also check out um, our upcoming schedule of events. And if you stick around, we're also going to play you a list of those events so you can see them for yourself here. Um, there's little for me to, to say, but again, to thank my guests and to thank you for um, tuning in. We're sorry that we couldn't get to all of the questions. We had quite a huge crowd tonight. So um, we might have, to, uh, might have to invite Clive back. Actually, in Australian Outlook, the... Uh, the, um, the, 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 the online publication of the Institute, which you can also find at our website. There will be a review of Head in Hand coming out next week by John West. And one of the recommendations is that Clive should follow up with another book. <laughs> so maybe we can have him back to talk about that. But for now, it's uh, good night from me and thanks again for tuning in. <laughs>